name is Roberto Chica. I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa, and it's my pleasure to introduce Rhodes Rakoto Arisoa, who's a PhD candidate in my group. So Rhodes is originally from Madagascar, that's where she grew up, but she trained in France. She earned her bachelor's degree in biology at the University of Paris 7. And uh, after that, she undertook a master's degree uh, still at the same university, but she performed her research under Thomas Simonson at uh, L'Ecole Polytechnique. And there she specialized in, in silico drug design. After that, she joined my group in the fall of 2018. And since then, she's been working on developing improved methodologies for computational enzyme design, which utilize ensembles of backbone templates instead of a single template, as is usually the case. And that's what she will tell you about today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, Dr. Shika, for this kind of introduction. Um, good morning uh, to all of you. So today I had the pleasure to present you the project that I've been involved in the laboratory of uh, Dr. Chika. This project is entitled Ensemble Based Enzyme Design Can Recapitulate the Effects of uh, Laboratory Directed Evolution in Silico. So enzymes are today you are today invaluable tools for many industrial applications due to their high efficiency to catalyze reactions. Uh, they can be used to make detergent, uh, and they can be also used for food processing, uh, biofuel industries, or pharmaceutical industries, as uh, we saw from a previous talk, that they can be used for manufacturing drugs. Uh, however, natural enzyme lack of uh, the increasing demand for natural, uh, natural for industrial applications and uh, the ability to create any uh, chemical, any artificial enzyme for any uh, desired chemical reaction is of great interest for, um, for computational enzyme design. In the computational design uh, enzyme design approach, we aim to create a theozyme, which is uh, the combination of catalytic side chains uh, arranged in a geometry uh, that uh, aims to stabilize the transition state. If we create a theozyme to uh, this theozyme is then uh, incorporated into a backbone template from crystallographic structure and is devoided from any uh, a reaction of interest. We then uh, place the steozyme into the backbone template and uh, uh, this is done in a combinatorial manner and whenever a match is found uh, we redesigned all uh, the, uh, the, the the axis site residues and we also allow rotations and translations of uh, the transition state and all of that is aimed to, to further stabilize the transition state. This method have, has been um, pioneered by the Mayo uh, group at uh, Caltech, as well as uh, the Baker, Baker Lab at the University of Washington. And just to name you a few examples of uh, the successful uh, enzyme design so far, we have the Kemp elimination reaction uh, that was designed by both the Baker Lab and the Mayo Lab, and we also have for example, the desalder or the ritual aldol reactions, which were designed by the, by the Baker Lab. Although it has been a success, there are uh, many challenges. And one of, uh, one of the challenges are the, is the uh, low catalytic efficiency of the designed enzyme. And here I'm showing you a box plot of uh, the KK over KM of a designed enzyme, of optimized enzyme, and the natural ones. And as you can see here, the designed enzymes have a catalytic efficiency orders of magnitude lower compared to that of the natural ones, and they can be if uh, they can be optimized through directed evolution to approach the catalytic efficiency of the natural ones. Another challenge of uh, enzyme design is prediction inaccuracy. Where here I'm showing you the design model uh, that it, uh, I'm superimposing you the design model here in Salmon with its crystal structure here in Cyan. And as you can see here, the two structures have uh, a difference. Uh, have a lot of differences. So because of these challenges, there is, uh, there, there is a need for, um, for the development of a robust methodology for enzyme design. Um, so uh, an example of a designed enzyme is EDG3, which has been designed by the Mayo Lab, and then uh, it has 
been uh, evolved by the HIVA lab. So um, this enzyme catalyzes the camp elimination reaction, which is uh, the concerted deprotonation and the ring opening of this 5-natural benzyoxazol to its corresponding O-cyanophenolate. The evolution of AJ3 has led to a thousand-fold increase in catalytic efficiency. And the mutations are both found proximal to the active site here in green and uh, uh, distal to the active site here in magenta. Previous structural studies on uh, a single mutant of uh, AG3, here AG2, and uh, a double mutant of AG317 um, crystallized with the transition state analog here, 6NT, have revealed uh, structural uh, features for enzyme catalysis. Except for example, we have this lysine 50, which was been mutated to a glutamine 50, a glutamine position 50, and that may further, um, that, and that uh, improve the catalytic contact with the transition state analog. Uh, we can also observe that the uh, AG317 has a better shape complementarity uh, com better active site shape complementarity compared to that of AG2. And we can also observe an opening of the active site entrance compared to AG2. So in this study, we were interested to uh, understand the, 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 the change in the structural, uh, the structural changes in the evolution of AG3. Therefore, in collaboration with the lab of the, the Fraser lab, we decided to solve the structure of AG3, its intermediates, and uh, the best variant at room temperature. So for the purpose of this presentation, I will focus on uh, the, uh, into the AG3 and AG317 uh, structural comparison. So the first, uh, the first, uh, um, feature that we investigated is the binding mode. And here uh, the, uh, we can see that the ligand pulse and the aspartate 127, which was designed to be a base, uh, did not change during evolution. The main difference here is the edge bond donor, which is a glutamine in position 50 for edge 317, and it is a water molecule for edge 3. The lysine in position 50, which was supposed to do edge to do an edge bond with the ligand, is not interacting with it at all. We also observe that uh, uh, the transition state analog is also uh, sandwiched between a methane in position 237 and a tryptophan in position 44, and that may also stabilize the transition state analog. Uh, a key determinant feature for enzyme catalysis is the active site pre-organization, which enables enzyme to bind the substrate in a geometry close to that of the transition state. Here, to show you the active site pre-organization, I'm superimposing the crystal structure of the bound structure here in gray with its unbound structure, where the major conformation is in magenta and the minor conformation is in green. And as you can see here, the major conformation of tryptophan 44 adopts a non-productive conformation that clashes with the ligand. And we can also observe uh, the same uh, thing for methionine 237 in a minor conformation, which also clashes, uh, which also clashes with the ligand. In comparison, in edge 317, only the tryptophan 44 in major conformation is clashing with the ligand, whereas the methionine 237 is not clashing and is also always pre-organized uh, in edge 317. So what we can say here is that edge 317 is better pre-organized compared to edge 3. Um, another key feature that we investigated is the active site entrance and the, and the active site shape complementarity. And here, as you can see here, AG317 has an active site shape complementarity that is, um, uh, that is better compared to AG3. And this is similar to what we've seen before in the structural studies of AG2. Uh, 
We also observe an opening of the active site entrance in Edge 317, where in Edge 3, the bottleneck radius is 1.57 angstrom, whereas in uh, Edge 317, it's 2 angstrom. We also observe other mutations in the entrance, an arginine and tryptophan to an alanine and a phenylalanine that may also uh, um, contribute to facilitating substrate entrance and product release. So what we found interesting here is the fact that most of the structural features appearing during um, appearing to be important for enzyme catalysis are proximal uh, to the access site. And more interestingly, the majority of these uh, mutations are positions that were optimized during the design of EJ3. So we were wondering if we keep those mutations proximal to the access site and we incorporating, we are, we incorporating them into the scaffold of EJ3, would we be able to um, recapitulate the structure of EJ3? 317. So we named this new enzyme, this new variant, AG4. We characterized it kinetically and we found out that uh, we found a 20% decrease in catalytic efficiency compared to AG317. So we studied the structural features of AG4. And here I'm still showing you the same uh, st uh, structural features that we just saw previously for AG317, and I'll compare that to AG4. So what you see that the binding mode of AG4 is nearly identical to that of AG317. The axis site is also well organized, where only the tryptophan 44 in the minor conformation is clashing with the ligand. And we can also observe a, 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 a similar active site shape com complementarity as well as um, a bottleneck radius um, of the active site entrance. So based on the insight we got from EG4, we were wondering if we can recapitulate uh, the structure of EG4 using our using uh, our computational methods. So to do so, we decided to use the computational enzyme design methodology used by the Mayo Lab to predict the structure of AG4. Uh, so here, um, uh, to, start, to start off, we performed a positive control, uh, um, control calculation in which the rotomers of uh, the AG4 uh, sequence were optimized on its own crystal structure. And, uh, I didn't mention before, but uh, all the calculations that we did are performed using the, the program called Triad. So here, uh, I'm showing you the result for the positive control, where uh, the crystal structure here is in gray, and the design model here is in magenta. And as you can see, the ligand pose is nearly identical to that of the crystal structure. And the main difference here is the methionine in position 267 that adopts a rotomer, a rotomer configuration different from the crystal structure. We also observe that the energy of the calculation is favorable. If we apply exactly the same protocol, but instead with the Y-type structure, the, 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 the structure used for uh, the design of EG3, here one gore, we observe that uh, there are uh, differences in, uh, in the model where the, the prediction is inaccurate, where here you can see that the ligand pose is different. And you can also see rotomers that are different from the crystal structure. And also we see that the energy is uh, higher compared to that of the positive control. We did exactly the same calculation, but with the crystal structure of EG3, and we observed similar results. So what we can uh, conclude from this is that prediction uh, accuracy varies depending on the backbone template used. And also that the procedure used by the Mayo Lab enables accurate prediction of uh, the sequence of EG4 on its own structure, on its own crystal structure. So uh, we were then, uh, based on that, we hypothesized that we should be able to um, predict Accurate, more accurately the sequence of EG4 if we find the correct backbone. So instead of using an, a single backbone, we decided to use an ensemble of backbone templates. The ensemble that we used is um, 
from the Ansible refinement protocol that is implemented into the program called Phoenix. Uh, crystallographic uh, program Phoenix. We take the crystal structure and then uh, this result, crystallographic structure is subjected to molecular dynamic simulation constrained by electron density, by the electron density. And then uh, just to show you how it works, if we focus on this loop, you can see that the rigid regions are constrained within the electron density, whereas uh, regions where there is low density electron density, uh, there is, uh, there are more flexibility. Uh, so uh, we take this ensemble and we use this ensemble to our, to our, no our next calculation. Here, I'm still showing you exactly the same positive control uh, if with AG4. And this is uh, the result that we got if we use the ensemble refinement from the white type template. So here you see a similar result that we've seen previously where the ligand pose is still different and rotomers, rotomers are also different. And we, uh, but we can see that the energy is uh, more favorable compared to what we saw previously. If we use the same calculation, but with the ensemble refinement uh, templates, uh, we, um, we got a more, um, we, we got a better um, prediction of uh, the AG4 structure, where here you can see that uh, the ligand pose is similar to that of uh, the crystal structure and uh, the rotomer configuration are similar as well. And lastly, you can see that the energy is close to that of uh, the positive control. So we can conclude that using an ensemble derived from a low activity enzyme enables more accurate prediction. Uh, to conclude, we, seen, we have seen that uh, um, inaccurate prediction contributes to a low catalytic efficiency. Of the enzyme and of the design enzyme, which emphasizes the need for the development of a robust methodology. Here we have used an ensemble enzyme, ensemble based enzyme design to improve the prediction of the AG4, um, AG4 structure. Our results uh, suggest that we could design a highly active, uh, de active enzyme without the need to rely on uh, um, to rely on directed evolution. Um, so in a future work, we are planning to use this uh, uh, protocol in an iterative approach to design new reactions, where a low activity de novo enzyme will be crystallized and then we'll build an ensemble from that and we'll create an artificial enzyme with a high activity. Uh, so I would like to thank my lab mates for their help and especially Dr. Aaron Boom, who initiated this project and performed kinetic analysis. I also would like to thank Niaj Zarifi, who, um, who assisted for the kin uh, kinetic assays. And I also would like to thank our collaborator from the Fraser Lab, who helped to solve the crystal structure, the uh, founding agency, uh, LS for the beam light, um, and Compute Canada for uh, computational resources. And uh, I would like also to thank uh, the organizer to give me the opportunity to present my work. And uh, I thank all of you for your attention. And I, for that, I'll take any questions. Thanks so much for a wonderful talk. And I'll say that that was actually extremely accessible to non-computational enzyme design people. So I really appreciate that. I, I learned a lot from your talk. Anthony, do we have any questions? Uh, so there's no questions coming at the moment. Um, I, I guess there's a, a bit of a delay while people just type up their questions. So Freddie Martin says, thanks for a great talk. Um, so may, maybe while those are coming in, then maybe, maybe I could just ask a quick question. And um, so, so in this in this particular instance, obviously you, you could be guided by the directed evolution, um, you know, in, in order to sort of I guess train your computational method. Where do you see the challenges lie now in try, in trying to create a de novo enzyme? You know, you, you're utilizing your new methods to create a de novo enzyme from scratch now. Yes. Uh, so if I understand correctly the questions, you're um, uh, so do you want to know the challenges of using computational enzyme design instead of using directed evolution, right? Uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is that yeah, so, so you've basically used the evolutionary data to, to train your computational method. 
Yes. Is, are there now like moving it the other way now so, so you're going to predict a new function or, or a new design? Is there some additional challenges which come with that process? Uh, so, um, uh, <laughs> I guess um, the challenge, the challenges with this, uh, so is the fact that uh, we may, because uh, what what we need to know from this uh, study is that we are uh, we are using uh, crystallographic structures from uh, the evolution uh, that uh, from the trajectory of edge three to Anderson, where the structural features are important for uh, for for catalysis, and we use that information to to um, to to do our design. And of course, if we didn't have uh, the uh, crystallographic structure, we we wouldn't be able to uh, to to uh, to guide our computational uh, methods. Uh, so, um, uh, so I guess uh, I, I'm I'm a little bit not sure exactly how I can answer in terms of the challenges, but yes, here we are uh, benchmarking our. Work. So I, I'm I'm so, I'm sorry for um, if I'm not answering correctly the, uh, the question. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely fine. That was, that was a good answer. Thanks. Yeah, I guess to follow up on this, we all look forward to new computation methods to help us to evolve enzymes faster. You know, 14, 20 rounds of evolution, that's something we would like to shorten. So, um, so yeah, so those new, new methods are very exciting. Um, do you think, following up on, on Anthony's question, um, do you think uh, the current uh, speed of crystallography uh, methods is is helping to to come up with better computation? Uh, yes, I, I would definitely say that uh, because of the improved in the crystallographic uh, uh, methods, we should be able to have uh, have a, a crystal structure that will help us to do our um, next round of design, um, and and also I want I would like to point out that um, all the templates that we are using here are templates that will be derived from crystallographic structure, and that will also may improve uh, the the the, the fat that may also facilitate the crystallization process because we already know that those structure those enzymes can be crystallized. Okay, so we have a question from Max F. So uh, several improved variants showed enlarged entry tunnels. Was that surprising to you or, or were the original designs too narrow? Or why would, sorry, why were the original designs too narrow? So here, uh, several, um, so in terms of this study, we have uh, seen that uh, the, the, the entrance was opening uh, during the evolution, and for the, the the lowest variant, we have seen that this uh, the entrance is narrower, where um, uh, the the bottleneck radius is around 1.57, where uh, this the one that for the best variant is two uh, around two angstrom. And I didn't show you the whole um, whole uh, uh, trajectory from my uh, presentation, but we see that there is an increase, a uh, an increase of these uh, bottleneck radius. And uh, this is due to the two mutations, uh, two mutations that are directly uh, in the entrance. This uh, um, elysin in position 50 and, the, and, the, and another uh, one in position 237 that uh, that increase uh, that uh, that is that fills these entrance and this and the position in uh, the position 50 that was mutated to a glutamine afterwards also contributes to enlarge this um, uh, the the entrance and uh, I would say that uh, I'm not surprised to see that it's uh, it's opening also it's also opening because uh, most of the computational procedure that has been Done so far don't include the uh, the, the the opening the entrance in their procedure. So this is actually another challenge that we face. But yeah, we are planning to to address that later. 
on March 10th that the designers of the Nova Lens and the Substrate, who plan to continue to use the clean barrel capital or use the knowledge of the organization of side chains and build from there? Uh, so for the next round of design that we are planning to do is to actually use Tim Barrel scaffold, of course, and also older scaffold. We're not we're not uh, go, we're not restraining uh, to only the Tim Barrel because um, we we actually want to um, access a, a large conformational space, and we we would like to gather a large uh, number of ensembles. And uh, we don't want to limit ourselves only for Timbar because we don't know if we, if other scaffold can uh, enable better, pr uh, pr better um, artificial design, or better prediction. Uh, and we can also uh, think of, uh, of uh, other uh, organization of side chains uh, over like, if I correctly understand the question, I would say that it is uh, uh, using a different uh, Rotomer library, for example, for doing the enzyme design. We can, uh, there are many things that we can try here. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's all, yeah. Okay, so we just have two more questions. So uh, Jackson Kant has put the top. To what extent, whoops, moving around. To what extent do you think the improved predictive power of the ensemble comes from sampling a more accurate confirmation versus capturing something of the actual dynamic movements of a native protein? Um, uh, something like that. Um, so, uh, oh, okay, uh, I, I, let me just read it again. So to what extent do you think the improved predictive power of the ensemble comes from sampling a more accurate phase capturing something of the actual dynamic movement of the nature. So, uh, so here, um, the ensemble refinement protocol aims to uh, actually predict the, uh, the dynamic movement, the mimic the dynamic movement of the protein because uh, uh, the ensemble refinement procedure um, uh, mimics uh, what we found in nature, because the movement of the protein is constrained by electron density map, which are um, uh, experimental data. So what this is what we, we we would like to recapitulate here is to recapitulate the the the, the experimental and uh, the, the the ensemble that we would see in a protein solution. In the interest of time, we'll just one more. This is really quite an important one. Um, so the kind of you use from low temperature or room temperature photography, because I think the ensemble distribution is different at different temperatures. Oh yes, yeah. so here we are using uh, room temperature uh, X-ray crystallography to uh, enable us to. So we want to have more. Um, more alternate confirmation. We want to sample more alternate confirmation that would not have been possible if we used uh, low temperature as uh, cryogenic temperature, for example. Okay, In the, there is only one more question. So if, if you don't mind answering one more, sorry, I know there's a lot. So um, I'm wondering if it's already possible to analyze thousands of ensembles in an automated way. Could you comment on that? Uh, yeah, I would, uh, I would say that uh, it should be, I'm, I'm actually trying to do that. I'm actually trying to analyze the, the thousand of ensemble because there are, uh, we can have a lot of ensemble. So yes, um, and, and, and the goal here is actually to find, um, to, to create this big ensemble to be able to find the correct backbone. So yeah, I would say that uh, it's really important to do that. 